Coming up on today's episode, Tesla launches in China, Starlink blots out the sky, and Freedom Gas. Let's get ludicrous. Hi, and welcome to Our Ludicrous Future. This is the website channel podcast thing where we talk about the future things that make the present thing look more like the past thing. I'm uh, Joe from Answers with Joe. And with me is Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. <laughs> wow, I hope I don't mess up my intro that much. Um, I'm Already Tom been. Rod. Ah, dang it. Uh, I'm <laughs> Tim Dodd, <laughs> the Everyday Astronaut, from stuff where you might look at it. Also is Ben Solens. You guys are killing me. This is Ben Solens from uh, Teslanomics. Wait, mm. I messed Damn it. Teslanomics. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I was going to say, you said Tesla. That was what? strange. Which is clearly the wrong way to say it for anyone listening, just to Don't be clear. Don't know who you are anymore. Yeah, Ben has changed. Time I, has I, changed you. I want to interview MKBHD and be like, is it Marquez or Marquez? That'll clear it up, you mm. know. Mm. I don't know. Is it well, you, you, maybe users? Maybe that's why it just goes by MKBHD. Is it users or users? <laughs> Dang, you're dropping some weird stuff now. on us. What are we talking about? Uh, enough of me rambling. Guys, we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> right? Isn't we always start shows? this thing off by saying, there's nothing that happened this week, and then, oh, wait, there's seven <laughs> things to talk about there. Yeah. Yeah, I literally, when I looked at it, we, we organize our show using Trello. And uh, when I'm, like, putting stuff in it, like, this morning, I'm sitting here like, oh, man. There's nothing I can talk about this week. And then I'm all of a sudden like, oh, oh, that was this week? Oh, yeah, that was this week, too. Oh, there's too much to talk about. It moves so fast. You feel that that was, like, ages ago. Seriously. Mm. The world that we live in, guys, is like, I I, we, I can't even keep track of it. Um, do, I talked about that we... in today's uh, video. I, 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 did a, I did a video to the people of 2219. And Ooh. and I basically make the point that like it's it's just really the world is changing so fast right now we're like right in the middle of this this like hockey stick curve, and it's hard to keep up with things and it's my job to keep up with things and I struggle with it so people who are yeah. just trying to get through their lives I'm sure it's it's just like but but is it the, the question and maybe you get into it in the video but I've always thought that, I've thought about this for a long time is it just that we have greater access to information and it's that information flows much quicker. Or is it that things are actually happening faster? I would assume I it might both. be both. Yeah. It's right. Probably because it's 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 like a chicken and egg. Like because yeah. information flows so much faster, other things also happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And development happens quicker, and people are educated quicker, and yeah, blah blah blah. blah. Now and I, I listen to this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I listened to this great podcast, and I can't remember where it was. So I probably shouldn't even say this, but they, they were interviewing somebody, and and she was making the point that, like back in the Middle Ages progress wasn't really a concept that most people understood. Like it, it just wasn't <laughs> like you would be lucky to see one innovation happen your entire lifetime. Right. But most like, people, oh, the lived the exact made... same lives. Yeah. They lived like... the exact same lives. Their parents did. Their children were going to live the exact same lives that they did. They probably didn't even move outside of a 10 mile radius mm -hmm. kilometer radius. And, <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, this idea of like progress and change is, it's actually kind of a modern thing. Hmm. Hmm. That is weird to think about. Yeah, yeah. It's like in Game of Thrones when I, when I'm like, "How did you get that information that quick? I don't I don't buy that somehow <laughs> someone died and like the next day, like boom, you know about it and you're like mounting a response or something. Yeah. I don't buy that. Like they didn't have they're, the internet. They're, they're ravens move at light speed. Yeah, hey, seriously. Like, what did is we this? did we already talk about this on the show? Because I, I really had a hard time with my friends. Talking. Did I tell you guys that the entire premise of the entire show is basically wrong? Our show? Yeah. No, about Game of Thrones. Oh, oh. So <laughs> I caught. I, I don't watch. I don't watch it. Didn't watch it. But I was in Seattle, and my friend. You know, I was arriving to my friend's doorstep right in the middle of the like one of the last episodes. I think the second to last episode ever. And so he had to like, you know, he had to like pause it or whatever, and like run down and open the door or whatever. And I walk in, and he's like glued to the TV. And uh, it's th that woman riding a, a dragon around, right? I'm no, no spoilers here. There's a woman that like rides At a this dragon. Point, that's like, go for it. And yeah. that's a big part of the show, it's right? Daenerys. Is, she's on a dragon. She right? has a name. But wrong. Yeah, she's right. not on a dragon. The whole show's wrong. That's a wyvern. 
Are you serious? This eight season show or whatever is wrong. Dragons have four legs. Oh, Wyverns okay. are basically giant bats. Okay. Mm. So I can't believe the show was just wrong the whole well, time. Well, the, the dragons were kind of a recent development in the show anyways. But they refer to them as dragons, right? Uh-uh. I've seen, like, episode one. I'm pretty sure they call her, like, Queen of the Dragons or something then. I mean, the Falcon Heavy is a spaceship. Well, what? it's it's a whole different <laughs> world, so they, they may have different definitions of dragons and wyvern mm. wyverns. Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. W-Y-V-E-R-N-S? It's like a bicycle like that, versus yeah. or a quad or something. It's just wrong. I just am, I needed to get that off my chest because I don't trust the facts of that show now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Everything wow. else is good. Everything that, else is that. that. However, <laughs> that's you, where you lost me. <laughs> you are nitpicky enough to be a commenter on one of my videos. <laughs> yes, well, I just yes. I just love how how you don't even watch the show. This is like getting parenting advice from people that don't have kids. You're like, oh yeah, sure, but, sure. Yeah, why don't they just? It's <laughs> it's why don't, like it's rocket science or people asking like, why don't you just with rocket science? Anyway, can I start off my bit of saying? <laughs> how excited I am. Like, I feel like I can finally breathe a little bit because, Oh, um, the Raptor video. Yes. I just want to, I just want to have, I just want you guys to congratulate me that I actually got it done. Of course. And Elon watched it. And yeah. And that's the weirdest thing is apparently within two hours, Elon mentioned great video and added notes. And these notes were literally like 40 minutes into this video. You, you now, <laughs> You so he, are a nice actually, guy. You didn't respond like, why don't you try watching the whole video first before commenting? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I cover that later in the video. But did he really <laughs> honestly watch a 50 minute long vi- YouTube video? I mean, mm. seriously, that's an actual question. I'm not trying to be like cocky. Like, yeah, he, do you really, uh, you know what I think potentially maybe he watches it with his kids He's got he a lot even of kids. Have his kids, except for like every other week or once a month or something. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he sat and watched it with his kids or something. It was the and weekend. They it was are a long clearly weekend. not interested in this. If he's interested in it, just to let you know how that how that works, <laughs> how parenting works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was, was it Chris Rock or somebody? It, it, it's like no matter or Jerry Seinfeld. Like no matter how successful and like something that is truly amazing to you, your kids will not have any interest in whatsoever. Mm-hmm. You know, even even when you're famous and you're hanging out with famous people, they do not care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you're still dad. Yeah, <laughs> they're still just playing Fortnite on their phones or something like that. I must have been different because I like admired anything my parents were involved in, and like my my dad loved cars, so I just loved cars. Like you know, starting at a very young age, like he'd be like, "Look at that," and I'd be like, "Oh yeah, dad, cool," you know, like, <laughs> and that never like that never wore off, you know, so. Mm-hmm. Maybe I was a weird kid. I know I was a weird kid. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> we probably need to start off uh, the show talking about maybe the biggest controversy in all of space. <laughs> and it's this. Those dragons flying around. <laughs> Wyverns flying around. Wyverns. SpaceX. Uh, this is a tweet from SpaceX following successful deployment of 60 Starlink satellites. They said... Uh, Successful deployment of 60 Starlink satellites confirmed. A great launch on Thursday night, uh, a week ago, as we record this. Uh, It was awesome. It was a great, it was an awesome launch. It was the heaviest payload SpaceX has ever flown, ever. And this was done on a Falcon 9, which is impressive. Um, Clearly, like, literally pushing the absolute boundaries of that vehicle. Uh, They deployed 60 satellites in this weird, it... Instead of the vehicle rolling, like because we kind of talked about this on the show last week, I said it won't roll like you would eat like a corn cob. It's going to go kind of end over end, and that's exactly what happened. And then these playing cards of satellites basically like frilled out from it. And it was this really cool deployment. Everything went great. Um, and now, uh, we, again, if we need more about that, we talked about it last week on the show. But now we have 60 satellites in the sky out of about probably there's going to be pretty quickly thousands as we know like maybe someday six thousand of these so a hundred times more 420 man and all of a sudden uh, the this whole thing came up where you know people are asking are we worried about space debris and light pollution and Mm. this started a whole 
Okay, major wait, so that's Elon's response thing. there. This is Elon's response. So let me, let me, yeah, let's provide the context. So um, a guy asked me on Twitter, any thoughts on Starlink satellites causing space debris and lighting pollution, uh, polluting the sky, according to what some people are saying? Because all of a sudden, um, a couple scientists had come up with like, hey, this is a very bad thing. Now I have to, you know, my ground observations are going to be compromised with satellites potentially moving through them. Well, I thought and it was because of that uh, video of the, like, dots in the sky flying by or whatever. I didn't think it was just a general statement. I thought, because there was a video of someone, yeah. where were they, Finland or Sweden or something? Mm -hmm. yeah. The and train yeah. of, of satellites. Yeah. Now, that, yeah. now, that was just, like, as they're going out, right? That's not, like, yes. constantly going to be looking like that. Right? They're going to be spread out and evenly distributed. Um, and, and not be dots of light. Um. Not That's, any more so than any other satellites that are out there. Right, right. Like I mean, you it's not like they've got giant mirrors on them or something. Well, that's kind of the debate, though, to be honest, is they do have very large sol us very large solar panel. Um, it should be significantly less bright than something like the ISS, you know, and, and I can yeah. barely catch the ISS. You have to try yeah. to catch yeah. the ISS. Right, um, okay. Even though it does fly overhead literally every night. Like, you have to be very vigilant to be able to spot it. Um. But this brought up a whole thing of people saying that they are already, you know, maybe if, you know, I, I can't speak from experience here because I don't do much proper <laughs> or any legit, you know, observations, space observations from the ground. I have no idea. I, I don't have like recollections or experience saying like, oh, dang it, there are satellites that are constantly interfering with my data. Um, I don't know. I, well, I don't did, know. Joe, didn't you do a video on big telescopes or... Whatever's coming up, yeah. Like there's recently. a bunch of different projects going on, right? Mm -hmm. And are most of them in space, or are they on Earth? These were all ground-based. Uh huh. In this particular video, yeah. But isn't there one going up that's like bigger than Hubble or something like that? Yeah, soon? the James well, Webb Space Telescope. James Webb has been postponed over and over and over again. There's one beyond that called Louvoir or Louvois, I guess, depending on that's, how you pronounce it. Yeah. Uh, that's bigger than James Webb. Uh, that was the one that that they did the rendering of Starlink or Starship <laughs> carrying it. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. So, Which would be really uh, cool. yeah. Okay. So, so this sparked off. Why don't we go through kind of the conversation here because it sparked off a whole big debate. And um, Eric Ralph, who writes for uh, Tesla Rati, says, "I am all for Starlink for the many potential benefits it may bring, but I think you may be downplaying the potential for disruption of each." Of those around 5,000 satellites in orbit, maybe 8 to 100 are in LEO. Way too early to jump to conclusions, but you may want to dive in a bit deeper. Gotcha. Right. That's a good point. And Elon said, if we need to tweak satellite orientation to minimize solar reflection during critical astronomical experience, that's easily done. Most orbital mm. objects are close to Earth, by the way, as shown by this NASA density map. And he shows a map that shows that yeah. the vast majority of satellites are in LEO and, and lower Earth orbit. Not sorry, I don't want to say lower Earth orbit because that's that's become a thing lately where people are saying lower Earth orbit for Leo. It is it low, low Earth, Earth orbit, period. <laughs> There's no er. Uh, <laughs> but like in this context, like a lower Earth as opposed to like a higher, you know what I mean? Sorry. Yeah. Just want to make sure that we're clearing that up because I'm hearing that a lot lately. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. So then Eric replies, uh, I'm sure. Okay. That wasn't one that Elon replied. Just then Fraser Kane, who runs Universe Today, uh, if they help billions of people in remote locations inexpensively access the internet, it's a price I'd be willing to pay. And Elon says, <laughs> "Thank you, Fraser, for making that decision for the entire planet." Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that we have this. I like is Fraser. Where Come on now. I, I, I have no idea who he is. I, I, he, I like he's an astronomer. Grammar. He's a strong an astronomer. So um, obviously, he does care. Universe Today. He's the, he runs Universe Today. Um, I don't even know what that is. Uh, it's a popular <laughs> astronomy based. And like, yeah, website. And anyway, so Elon says, exactly. Potentially helping billions of economically disadvantaged people and is the greater good. That said, we'll make sure Starlink has no material effect on discoveries in astronomy. We care a great deal about science. Right. Obviously. Fraser said, but if you can throw up a few Starlink chassis space telescopes, I'm sure that'll smooth things over with the astros, astro community, especially since they'll be able to return the data quickly via Starlink. <laughs> Uh, so then Elon said, we'd love to do exactly that. Hmm. Um, this kept going. There was a lot more um, about this. Where was the... 
So, Elon even mentioned the brightness of the satellites could be altered. Um, yeah. And that he's already sent a note to the team to make sure to reduce the albedo or the brightness, ref, you know, the reflectivity that once they're fully deployed and fully circularized and in their proper orbits and the solar rays are facing the sun, that there'll be less reflectivity. I mean, there's a lot of variables. And I, I do hope that this definitely sparked a conversation, which I think is a good conversation to have. Um, but I, we do want to also make sure that <laughs> we're judging the final result and not judging the preliminary you know, as these things are deploying, as they're floating at strange angles, they could be a lot brighter right now. They could be a lot closer. Don't forget, light works with the square inverse law. So if they go from even 400 to 500 kilometers, it'll reduce brightness by about 50% already. Um, not like 20% like you'd think, you know, because it's 20% further away. It actually reduced brightness by about 50%, which is a big deal. So, um, yeah, it's it's a whole. Okay, yeah, there we go. Ben is showing us the trail of 60 satellites up in the sky. Yeah. That you can to see. me, it sounded like th this would be constantly visible. Oh, no. Yeah. No, no, no. And to no, me, no, no. like the, maybe that was just me being, you know, not diligent and just reading headlines, but it's like, yeah, I don't care what the purpose is. I don't want to look up at the night sky and see a, all this. Just see Imagine a line, this, multiple yeah. lines across the sky. Yeah, so if it's basically like every other satellite, you know, then I think that's fine. I, I don't think it'll be a, a, an issue. What it will be, have you ever seen the ISS pass? Only in your photo with the long shutter. <laughs> Joe, have, have you ever gone outside and, and seen an ISS I, I've pass? Seen, yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy looking. It, it is really cool. And like, it, looks, it looks like I live a star in a place where that you is can just see it. traveling across the sky. Yeah, it looks like yeah. it's, yeah, that's exactly what it looks like. <clears throat> and, um, what this would be, like in the worst case scenario, what this would be at any given point in ever, basically, especially like right after sunset, right after the sun goes down and you experience darkness here on Earth or right before the sun rises, there's about an hour there um, after true, like, you know, when it's actual dusk and actual dawn, um, where the satellites are still receiving full sunlight because they're up higher. But it's the ground dark, is dark. Yeah. Yep. Though yeah. That is the maximum time. So worse goes the worst. Even if uh, they won't be as bright as the ISS, but say they were, what you'd see is at any given time, you could see one or two, maybe three of these dots moving across the sky for at that brightness, like as bright as a star, you'll see an extra star moving across the sky is what you'll see. But, but also think about how much smaller these things are than the ISS. Yeah. And, and even way the smaller. ISS, like you really have to strain to see it. Yeah. You have to be paying attention. Is there a way to know where it is? Is there like a website that tracks that? Yeah, there's a website. <laughs> there's ISS tracker and there's apps and stuff. It's fun. You can get alerts when it's going to be a bright pass over where you're going to be, you know, like where you are. It's really cool. Um, so worst goes the worst, you're going to see three to four moving stars in the sky um, that are as bright as stars for an hour each night, maybe. Um, but the but question is whether or not it will mess up the... Uh, astronomy at all sounds like probably not and right. it, you well, know the idea that they'll adjust course based on people's requests I, I have a hard time believing but it, it whatever I don't think it'll be a big deal because you'll just wait five seconds and it'll go by unless you have like some sort of thing you're trying to do that can't like like a long exposure kind of a thing where like it comes into view and goes out like I have to keep this lens open right. or whatever that whole time you know, I could and say I, it causing some issues, but I mean, it doesn't sound like I thought from the headlines I saw that it was going to literally be like a blanket of these white dots over us all the time. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, God, no, 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 yeah. that's not OK. The only telescope I think that it could really impact, because another thing to keep in mind, the, these telescopes, when they focus in on a galaxy 30 million light years away, I mean, they're only getting this this teeny, teeny, tiny patch of the yeah. sky. Mm -hmm. And the chances of one of these satellites, any of the 5,000 plus satellites that are out there right. running across that tiny little patch of sky is so small. Mm -hmm. But there's one called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. And its gig is it basically pictures the entire sky every night. Mm -hmm. uh, so it actually could be a little bit impacted by this. Um, but the rest of them, it's, it's not that big a deal, but, but I think like, you, you know, I get all ranty about the way media covers things and I, you know, they've clearly decided that, 
or discovered that if they do a negative headline that has something about Elon in it, it's going to have a whole, whole bunch of people share it on Facebook, which I saw some myself. And what what gets what gets me going and ranty about it is the fact that like. Those are 60 satellites out of 5,000 that are up there. And SpaceX isn't the only people putting up constellations of satellites. Iridium's been doing it for a long time. OneWeb is another company that's doing it. Um, and this is something that, I mean, it, it is good to be talking about this because we are going to be putting exponentially more satellites up in the sky. I mean, that's what Rocket Lab wants to do. That's what Blue Origin wants to do. Bigger satellites actually doing construction in space. This is something that's going to be a bigger part of our future as we move forward. So it is something we're talking about, but don't demonize one company. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a trend that like everybody is getting on board with right now. We need to have the conversation about the trend of, yeah, the entire shift of the industry. Right. Um, I, I want to talk about it in the sense of, um, that, oh, what was it? You said something that, Triggered something. Uh, someone He's else triggered. talk. Well, he got triggered. Uh, I got triggered. I got super triggered. Um, dang it. I don't remember what I was going to say now. But <laughs> Well, um, it, I have an interesting, well, just a question about it. So hmm. I don't know why I don't know why this came up the way you were thinking, but the way, probably because I just did a video on it, but the way cars used to be designed is like every switch in a car had to have its own separate wire and its own separate line. And that led to a car requiring miles and miles worth of copper wire, which made it more expensive, which made it mm. all kinds of problems. And then they figured out, hey, if we just have computers in the car controlling things, we can just have one wire that lets them talk. And so instead of having thousands of different wires, we just have one wire and then the computers do the you know figuring out what to do uh, part. So that reduced that. Could satellites be, or are they in some way like this where we don't, like, I want to launch a thing. It doesn't mean I have to have my own satellite. It's like I just lease time on someone else's satellite, and mm -hmm. they all work together. Like, maybe Starlink could be that, where you use it as a computing resource or some some other kind of a thing. So you don't necessarily, like, like is there a, a, a cap to how many satellites we need to do basically mm -hmm. anything we want to do? Or is it a forever, never-ending, until infinity mm -hmm. cycle of launching new things to do one task, right? That's, that's well, an interesting question. The the big thing about a, a constellation like Starlink is that it's uh, it's going to be changeable. So like it, you know, we'll have generation after generation, and these things will only last a couple, you know, three, four, five years. Are intentionally mm -hmm. deorbited at the end of their lifespan, and then a new generation is replaced. And soon the the market might shift where it's like, wait, yeah, we don't need to launch a telecom satellite we'll just lease time on starlink or whatever okay kind of like how how your cars are right so the model 3 now has the hardware for full self-driving even though the software isn't there so it's like cool right. i don't need to redesign and redevelop new hardware i right. can already reuse what's existing just by updating the software exactly right maybe yeah. i mean it's hard to predict stuff like that because yeah it requires but, I mean, we'll people have to get to a point where we no longer need to send up thousands of satellites Otherwise, Correct. like, and do all satellites de-orbit? Like, do they all die at some point? Or are there some that have been up there, you know, for 30, 40 years or however long? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Launching um, satellites. Ones, the lower the altitude, the, the quicker they de de decay by a lot. There's a, a, an exponential curve there, too, where the lower your altitude, mm -hmm. just like, you know, you can imagine if it was really low, you know, when actually hitting a significant amount of atmosphere, it wouldn't last more than two minutes, and you know, <laughs> before deorbiting. Yeah. Um, but... Like, for instance, SpaceX changed their orbit to be 550 kilometers from, I think, about 1,000 originally because of that, uh, the idea that if a satellite were to die, it'd come down in several months as opposed to several yeah. years. Like, so like they're constantly the catching just a little bit of drag from the very, very, very upper atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And they've got little ion thrusters on there with, what, what are they, they use Krypton, Krypton instead of Xenon. Yeah. So, so they're like, they can kind of like move themselves up just a little bit as they go along to keep from going down. But whenever basically i mean you know i i am nervous about space junk and mm -hmm. and that is something else worth talking about when you have a whole bunch of stuff up there but that that made me feel a lot better when i found out how low their altitude was because as as soon as it runs out of fuel as soon as it dies it's i mean just a few months it's going to catch enough drag and deorbit itself mm -hmm. um so i remember what i wanted to talk about was uh the the concept kind of of people being mad that like we're ruining mother nature you know, and Ben, you're probably in that boat of like, no one asked me if it's okay to put, you know, extra stars up in the sky, basically. Like, 
well, why did they get my and they're doing this yeah. across the world so now you know people that might use this guy as a you know form of worship or something might have their their views physically altered you know um is that okay and to me I, my opinion on some of that is like honestly that's kind of part of human progress like we drive cars and you know through nature reserves you know like through really beautiful parts of land there's now roads like did anyone ask <laughs> it had to get a seal of approval from every so, human in the world before we ruined but that's yeah the ground I mean, there that's a slippery slope though right like is it? I, I think that the sky is one of those things where it's a bit different in my in my view Can we all because share it? Yeah, I mean, it's one thing if a country wants to rip out its rainforest to make money, um, which is happening, right? And that's how a lot of these this progress has been made by kind of exploiting the natural resources. The sky is something that none of us like own, really. It's to, to me, that that that's where it's a little bit different. It, it, it's it's like the question last time about mining asteroids and stuff. Like, who owns the moon? Is it whoever gets there first? You know, we put a flag up, right? Can we just like start drilling? into the moon and like just you know extracting stuff and like messing with it or is like the whole planet like wait a minute wait a minute that's you know you own it just as much as i do because we're all human we all live here or something I, I don't know like to me that's where it's a little bit like the whole fake constellation or fake meteor shower thing we talked about that a while ago mm. and then like the slippery slope you go from fake meteor shower to starbucks banners in the sky <laughs> <Right>. you know <laughs> like it's like a you know you can connect those dots literally yeah. to, to me i think it's a little bit different like you're right certainly there are changes in using natural resources for human progress is something that's just inevitable but to me i think the sky is just a little bit special in, but do you are you different. mad about airplanes being in the sky and ruining yeah. your view at night <laughs> no i actually like that uh i live where uh, planes fly directly over and to me it's actually like a, a really cool thing so to me that's like the the ultimate argument is like people are like i can't believe there's gonna be extra lights in the sky i didn't ask for this it's like why aren't you complaining about airports and airplanes they're oh, all over oh, no well people are clearly are they do they it's like <laughs> yes. guys that's part of 100%. then you can't fly then sorry if you don't like this you don't get to fly like either <laughs> either never get on an airplane or yeah. like and complain about it or just accept the fact that that's just part of the reality we live in these days like yeah well it's, we simultaneously want to live on the moon and have big space stations in space but then we don't want you know the the side effects of that it, it's gonna come with the territory it's, it's gonna be there you know well and let me just say that in 20 30 40 years uh the idea of ground-based observations might be a joke like the idea that we'd use telescopes on the ground where we have to go through our own atmosphere might well, just be like laughable and, and all science will be done because it'll be so cheap to put something in space that all of our ground based telescopes will be totally inferior to space based telescopes. Well, most telescopes, if I understand correctly, aren't actually uh, uh, f looking at optical lights. light, right? They're Visible radio light. telescopes, right? Is most of what we actually do nowadays, That's right? Electromagnetic spectrum all the way across, yeah. Right, yeah. right, but it's not so taking an actual visible, photo, right. which right. would be more probably uh, affected by one of these, is not even like the majority of what's done, from what I understand. Correct, well, and, but... and to be fair, that that was another argument was that all these satellites up there are going to be throwing off a lot of radio and microwaves to connect with each other, and that could cause problems with that kind of astronomy. Yeah, that, that's a so. that, that's a fair point, but I mean, we'll we'll have to see. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Again, this is this is a delicate balance. Um, I I don't do science data <laughs> observations. <laughs> like I, this isn't my realm, so I'm not gonna talk about it. Besides, like just casually like this with you guys, um, I'm definitely not gonna do a video going in depth about it because I don't have those answers. That's something yeah. that I don't think anyone has the answers to currently. We're gonna just have to see. You know, once this the first sixty are rolled out and in their proper orientation and doing all the stuff. Make some observations, make some data, you know, collect all that and then see what the implications are and then have, a, you know, maybe it would be nice to have like a, a place for people to voice their concerns. I, I'm glad that so far Elon is and SpaceX seem to be listening to this concern. Um, but yeah, it, it is one of those. It's a, it's a touchy subject, isn't it? I think the, the, the concept of 
lights in the sky permanently all over the world to me i was like wait a minute that can't be right and it's not so <laughs> no. you know yeah. so i'm fine <laughs> yeah like like but but i could i think as just just as a general as we get you know it gets easier to put things in space this is going to continue to be a thing obviously elon and spacex and tesla make great headlines that people click on so the media is just just kind of bound mm -hmm. to write buy it right mm -hmm. right you know use that but whoever's doing it, I think that, like, eventually someone, like, we'll all have to come together and have some kind of rules or some kind of thing. If mm -hmm. we don't already, maybe we do, and we're all dummies. I know just that there's dummies. some rule against advertising. Like you said, putting a, a giant Starbucks banner up in space. I know there's some, I know there's a rule about that. Somewhere. There's not a rule about advertising for cheetahs on the beach in San Diego, I will tell you that much. <laughs> cheetahs or Cheetos? Cheetahs. Cheetahs? It is a, it is a dance club. Oh, <laughs> mm. I, I was wait, honestly. Wait. This isn't cheaters <laughs> in, yeah. in uh, Cape Canaveral in Florida. Oh, no. oh! Shout out to cheaters in Cape Canaveral. We drove Great. by that too many times. Uh, you'll if you're down in Cocoa Beach, you'll drive right past a gentleman's club called Cheaters. Hilarious. <laughs> And I, I think that, did, about it did I text one... you guys that you're like no way that's not the name of it I'm like look it really is. <laughs> like we're just being honest guys yeah <laughs> Call calls it like, it it like I sees it yeah <laughs> Florida uh, the honest state um, speaking of Florida and honesty <laughs> what this is a terrible segue okay so next um, story <laughs> this this guy uh, Kimmy. I, I'm going to totally mispronounce his name, but I see him all over the place. He does phenomenal 3D renders. But uh, Kimmy Talviti. Can you guys help me? I want you guys to also have to. Talvi Talviti? Talviti. That sounds pretty good. Kimmy Talviti. Um, hey, Kimmy. First off, fantastic work. Kimmy does really, really good 3D renders that I'm seeing all over the place. There's some really talented artists out here, guys, lately that are making phenomenal <laughs> renders. Um, and Elon popped in here. And started talking about um, changes already <laughs> to the design. So this is this picture. The render we're seeing of Starship is the render that we've been seeing now since um, like the Dear Moon, where there's the three big kind of fins on the back that are also mm -hmm. flappy landing leg things. Apparently, that's going to change, guys. Um, he said that they well, first off, the whole like single stage. To, so the idea of doing the, the point to point Earth transportation thing. They're realizing that this new design, they can do it with only the upper stage for point to point, mm. um, which is cool. So they can do, uh, they can decrease the cost and complexity uh, for distances of around 10,000 kilometers with a decent payload um, at Mach 20 with just the upper stage. So, so this is the original thing where you can fly from new york to shanghai in 30 minutes or something exactly right? and for that the performance of this booster and the performance of the rocket wouldn't even need the booster it would just need the upper stage which is crazy to think about um so where was it that he talked about um he ended up talking about changes to the flaps already again which uh of course uh is another change uh i can't find that here so here we go here we go he basically said, uh, wings, flaps, and legs design is changing again. <laughs> In parentheses, <laughs> sigh. <laughs> Doesn't affect schedule much, though. So this, okay, this brings up that topic that we've talked about a lot, which is why does this stuff keep changing? And if you were paying attention to our podcast or anything that Elon does, stuff changes all the time. And Joe, I think you just brought up a couple weeks ago, or Ben, one of you guys said, like, Elon is not one of those, like, stick to his guns, I have to do this because I said I'm right. going to do it. His opinion and the opinion of their companies seem to change based on experience and data and what will make That's the most sense going yeah. forward. And this is still that. And I, it's funny. He's going to rub... The, we're, we're going to see this. Where we have an expectation for one thing and then as something changes. And I've talked about this even with the Starhopper, how they don't even know what's next with Starhopper because they haven't tested... You know, once they test stuff and fly it, then then they'll develop what they need mm. for the next stage of it. Instead of like totally designing it on paper first, designing every single aspect of it, and then hoping it all works out once it gets to the launch pad, screw that. That's expensive and timely, and it 
could lead to big mistakes. This this idea and the way they're developing Starship and Starhopper is literally a blank slate. It's let's let's get an engine. They got the engine. <laughs> the engine's like pretty much done. Now let's start doing stuff with it. And the design will change. And I'm excited to see a new design change. Uh, and this is a physics driven science experiment. Mm. It, How it's much almost do like you think good. I was gonna say it's almost like open source development and how mm -hmm. that works. Mm -hmm. How yeah, yeah. Uh, like at, at Mozilla we had this whole concept of when you make software, when you make things out in the open, you end up with a better result because it's not five people in a room, uh, you know, mashing their heads together. It's thousands of people online mm -hmm. sharing ideas and using mm -hmm. all the collective expertise mm -hmm. and um, finding problems that you would have never found in yeah. a very closed environment. So, I don't know if it's exactly open source, but it's pretty. It sounds very similar to just like, <laughs> hey, here's this thing, and then it was like, whoa, 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 hey, whoa, whoa. and then you're like, oh, okay, just kidding. Now it's this thing. Oh, okay, and then you know, you just kind of this iterative development cycle. It's yeah, kinda, you know, it's kind of nice to see. And before we go to Joe's, it, some companies might do that already. We just don't see it. They just keep it internal. It might be that fluid of a design for a couple years where you're, it changes, but they just don't talk about it. They don't show us. And that might be the other difference too, is, is SpaceX and Elon are just so open, so out there, you yeah. know, so publicly available that we get hints of this stuff and it's and it's mm -hmm. it's different and fun. Joe, what were you gonna say? Exactly what you just said. Ah, <sighs> crap. Well, I was posing it more of a question, like how much of this is stuff that n always happens, it's just not out in the open for everybody to see it, and how much of this is just a totally unique and, you know, SpaceX way of doing things. Right. I, well, I don't know. I, That's an open question. So. Right. I I definitely think that like the things like the, the competition now between the two orbital prototypes in Florida and Boca Chica, as we talked about the, the other mm -hmm. week, how they're literally building two separate, you know, starships, basically. And uh, I think that's pretty unique because they're developing an internal competition. And, you know, competition definitely can bring out the best in everything, you know, and companies mm -hmm. and, and all that stuff. I think that's pretty unique for the aerospace industry. I haven't heard of that. They It's an actual competition? Mm hmm Yeah, they have two teams and basically it, seeing who can within do Within the, the same best, company? Fastest. Yeah, they're both SpaceX. So they're not sharing information? They are, though. Because I thought originally they weren't sharing information. He said actually both teams are required to share what they're learning, but they're mm -hmm. not required to use that idea. Weird. But it is a competition. Yeah, I have different views on competition from a business perspective. That being someone that worked in corporate America for a long time, it it is like the sour. It's a way to ruin a lot of great progress. Is is my view on it. So it's interesting to me that they're doing that. Um, maybe aerospace and design stuff is different, but yeah, I've never I've never seen it uh, bode well, personally. Hmm. Just in a cult, yeah. uh, company culture kind of thing. So if you think about it, let's say we're all employees on a team here. We're all software engineers or something like that. And a lot of companies will incentivize you uh, for what your work, right? Hey, you'll get, a, you'll get a raise if you meet these goals or whatever. Cool. So, hey, Joe, can you help me with the thing I'm doing on? Because I'm really struggling with it. No, you need to focus no. on your work so you can achieve your goals so you can get a raise to, you know, send your kid to that private school or whatever. You're yeah. not going to help me. Yeah. And then as a team, we suck. Because our our goals, our 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 efforts as a team are not aligned. They're they're aligned against each other. Yeah. Which means we're instead of cooperating and helping and growing and making progress collectively, we're we're fighting. I guess it depends um, on so how I, you frame I, the competition. Like, is there a monetary incentive at the end of it for winning, or is it just bragging rights? Um, are you gonna get fired well, if you don't win? And then whatever you're just it is. Yourself? Yeah, I mean, it for me, it's one of those things. Like, like for the you know many many years I spent in management, um, I would always try to uh, make sure the entire team worked to, together. Mm -hmm. It's almost like when when the Lakers had that uh, that entire cast of like Hall of Famers years ago. I don't know if you remember, it was like Carl Malone and you yeah. know Kobe and Shaq and everybody, and they were terrible. <laughs> because they were a terrible team because they all were such great yeah. individual players that they only cared about their own success and not each other's. So it's interesting to hear that. I'm curious how, how it'll turn out. I mean, I, I think, you know, people can uh, criticize or have different views than me, obviously, and I'm not Elon, so and I don't have that success, so you can say, well, he's great and I, and I suck. But uh, 
Elon runs a lot of his companies this way. And every time I hear him talk about the business side of it, I'm always just like, oh, God, dude, this is terrible. Like, don't do that. Don't do that. I hope this turns out differently. But well, if it's a real competition, uh, that doesn't sound good to me personally. The one of the things you talked about, though, was like teamwork and, and working as a team. But, you know, this is large teams of people developing a vehicle. And I it seems to me like if you have one team working on the same thing and another team doing the exact same thing and they're both like sharing each other's information, they have access to that. And then you're going to end up with two probably very different styles of how to develop a vehicle. Like to me, they're going to learn a lot of things about manufacturing a nine meter wide stainless steel vehicle um, by doing a competition like this that they wouldn't have developed that they wouldn't have perspective on. Um, without really rigid uh, having structure. Having autonomous teams work toward a shared goal is one thing. Having an actual competition is different. If if we have an actual competition where there is something that matters, whether it be money or bragging rights or whatever it is, I'm not going to share that information with you. I am going to keep it to myself and I'm going to win the competition. Because the nature of having a competition is you are incentivizing people to win. And by winning that means someone else loses, right? So that, that, that's what I'm getting at. Like, like fundamentally, and in humans, we're like just, just so it's ingrained in like our evolution of, of who we are to want to win when we're given that kind of a scenario. So I think it's different if you're saying, hey, guys, look, let's, let's have a couple autonomous teams. And the goal is to, to make this a, a singular thing. Um, that's great because then they both can innovate without having to like check in with the other one. But if you literally say, hey, uh, you guys are going to come to my private island and we're going to have a, a, a party this weekend, or the team that, that does it the best, and then the other team, you don't get to come, that alone will, I think, create incentives for people to work against each other. And that's just what I've seen from personal experience. And, you know, you, you can read, you know, it's probably the most boring thing ever, but like a lot of like business theory about this stuff. But so like... I feel like generally my philosophy is humans are driven by incentives, largely. And for most of us, that's financially based. Um, there are, of course, other incentives and things like, you know, I don't know, uh, yeah, bragging rights, getting a promotion, whatever the case may be. So so fundamentally, I think that th my view is you should have people working together towards something. Um, but if you have autonomous teams, like, like, it's fine. But if you say there's a competition, you guys win, you guys lose, I think that creates a, a toxic kind of kind of environment like like you're aligning incentives for people to go against each other hmm. regardless of what the what the goal or, or is you know joe what do you I, think no i i, I hear you I, I understand that i mean and i come from a, a corporate background too i spent 12 years in a cubicle farm and and they they would have um quarterly awards where one person like <sighs> Shoot, am I gonna go on a tangent here? Um, tangent, yeah. Tangent. Tangent. Uh, the, so it, it was it was advertising and sales kind of thing. So the salespeople, it's pretty easy. Whoever sold the most got the award, right? I mean, you can it's a tangent. It's a, it's a number. You know, whoever had the highest number would get the award. Which, by the way, many companies are getting away with uh, commission based compensation for salespeople because of this. Right. Yeah. So it's that same. So it's manifested exactly like that. Yeah. Well, so they, they extended that to my department, which was more of a creative department, because they just wanted to make sure that we got recognized too. Well, the problem with the creative part is there, there's no just number they can point at and say that's a clear winner. It's a very subjective thing. Mm -hmm. The managers vote on it, and the same people would win over and over again because they were part of the little inner circle, and it, it it became a horribly toxic atmosphere. And I what I was saying to to them was I was like, look when when one person wins an award, you got one person that feels recognized and you have a whole department that doesn't feel recognized, mm. you know? Um, mm -hmm. So I, what I'm saying, the whole point of all that is I can see how it can lead to a toxic environment, but I think it just depends on how you do it. And I don't know how they do it, so I, I, can't, I can't say one way or another, but hopefully, hopefully yeah. it, it works out and it leads to some innovations and they share those and it just kind of speeds things along, but I don't know. It, it's a real tough nut to crack. Like, there, I don't think any company's ever figured it out. Um, whether or not you're officially labeling something as a competition or you're just doing what you were saying, Joe, it, at some point or another, like, it, it, it's, it's a very different way of thinking about business as a system instead mm -hmm. of how most businesses are done where, yeah, there's individual awards, recognition, whatever. Now, and that, that, that creates problems, you I, know? I will say, though... 
in the specific instance that I was talking about where I came from, there wasn't like, there wasn't like an overarching goal that we were working toward. It wasn't like we were building a thing like they are. It was just like, you're doing your job, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's the same job you did last year and there's no promotions. And I, uh, I always I laugh like at, at like employee or at, at a McDonald's or something when there's like employee of the month and you're like, there's like 15 people that work here. Like everybody's going to get it eventually. Right. <laughs> like how could you like, Oh, it's Joe again. Yeah, good job, Joe. And then everyone hates Joe because you're always the the winner. That's you know? that's exactly what happened where I was working, though. Right. It was like mm. yeah, the it's... same people winning it over mm. and over again, and it just Dang. got to be like, dude, what the hell? You just hate that person, right? You're just yeah. like, oh, great. Yeah. yeah. E- either either you you kiss their butt and try to get their favor because you want to be recognized like they are, or you just resent them. I'm, it's bringing up bad emotions. Don't make me think about those days. <laughs> this is a, a section we like to call therapy. <laughs> just got... You'd be laying down. Mm. Actually, so I, I could go off on a rant if we're ready to get off this topic. Yeah, Joe is rants. It, Joe is it rant rants. time? Totally it's different rant. Time. rant. It's rant yes. time. Um, have you guys seen the, the Audi e-tron commercial? I've uh, seen... Is it the one I talking about it, like... The Sorry, ice or cold or whatever, like in any condition. Is that the one? No, that's not what this was. Mm, I saw it before, I as a pre-roll before a video, so I thought maybe you guys had seen one too. But uh, anyway, so let's let's just jump in. Audi has a commercial app for their e-tron, and which is their electric car, obviously. Um, which I don't even know. Is it officially on the market yet? Like, can you even buy it yet? I've seen one in the wild. Okay. One right. actually, yeah. Cool. I mean, they're out here. Um. I, I have to kind of do the disclaimer that I always give. I want to see electric cars succeed. I don't care who makes them. Um, but I'm starting to feel the cynicism that many other people are feeling that while I want electric cars to succeed, I don't think the car companies want electric cars to succeed because this ad literally made me laugh out loud. <laughs> out loud. It was li- okay. I'm paraphrasing because it's been a few days, but this is basically the gist of it. It, it starts off and it's got footage of the e-tron and the voiceover says, I know what you're thinking. And then it goes, it doesn't have enough range. It doesn't have enough power. There's no place to charge it. And he lists like eight or nine different horrible things that everybody thinks about electric cars. And at the very end of it, he goes, think again. And that's the end of it. I was like, you literally just spent your entire commercial telling everybody why they shouldn't buy this car. Oh man. Is this the one? Hey, don't maybe don't play it. We'll get a copyright strike. <laughs> oh, whatever. Uh yeah, whatever. no, no, this is not it. Yeah, they they had this whole campaign. It was like not for you, it's called. Oh. Uh, it's like Audi Etron, like like maybe it's not for you. It's kinda of, kinda of like <laughs> negging. It's kinda of like Yeah. <laughs> what? I don't get it. Yeah, it feels like, <laughs> honestly, it might be because they're like, guys, just four years ago, we redeveloped the entire platform with this engine, and we have to have this engine last for 10 years for our products for, in order to pay off the, well, they the engineering have... and the all that stuff. So now we're just like, okay, we have to develop this electric car. Let's just call it the, the poop car, which is basically what it is in France. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's wrong. <laughs> I mean, so, so I, I've seen one in the wild, and um, the the car shop where I get my cars worked on sent me a photo, one that, that just came in the other day. Uh, so there's there's a couple different things under the e-tron label, right? There's the SUV thing, and then there's the uh, the, the GT, which is like the sports car, mm-hmm. sports sedan, which isn't out yet. That one is still, I think, a year away or so. Uh, but when I saw it in the wild and the photos I've seen, it's, it's like a normal-looking Audi. Mm-hmm. I think it's cool that like it's a mm-hmm. normal looking car. It's yeah. people won't be you know, it's not the BMW uh, bubble on top of a turtle thing. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's like you know like it's a good looking and Audi obviously makes great v- vehicles like cars mm-hmm. from the car standpoint. It's fantastic. Same with the EQC. My buddy Dan just got to drive that and it's a Mercedes. It looks great as a Mercedes. Like all the trimmings and the finishes are fantastic. Um, I really want to see us getting to the point where we start reviewing electric cars like we review phones. So, yeah, you like, said that is last this an, week. Yeah, is this an OLED display? What is this? Right. You know. Right. Um, yeah. And the e-tron and the EQC and a lot of these feel just like regular cars to me. And, and I think they're missing the point as to why Teslas are so cool. Mm-hmm. It's like the fact that it's electric is kind of secondary. You know right. mm-hmm. that the, those technologies could be applied to any car. Yeah. 
Yeah, totally. Regardless of the propulsion. Um, this brought up, a, I actually had a, a really interesting discussion with a friend who him and his girlfriend are looking at a new car and they're potentially looking like she brought up the Audi e-tron. And what's cool. interesting, because she goes, I don't like the way Tesla looks. Like, that was her thing about the X. She wants an SUV, but she doesn't like the look of the Model X. So, but they're like, but uh, the Audi looks so good. And here's what I think is going to happen. I think all of these new electric cars coming on market is honestly a really good thing for the entire industry, but also for Tesla specifically, because now subjectively, people are going to start looking at the e-tron saying, okay, it's X amount of money, $70,000 or whatever it is. It has this amount of range. It has this charging infrastructure. It has this for self-driving. And then they're going to go, wait, 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 wait. It, it's, it's quantifiably worse than Tesla. Ding, like, ding, ding. Yeah. So I think Mercedes, that'll be interesting. But go ahead. People's opinion on how things looks are sub- subjective. Like I've, I've never right. really been a fan of how the X looks personally. No, but 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 the point, it, it, by the way, I'm with you on that. But the point <laughs> is uh, uh, that... With these other car companies coming out with these new uh, options, it makes it okay. It makes it mainstream. Yeah. It, it it tips the scale in favor of oh, I can buy an electric car now. Yeah. And and then when you start looking at the specs of an electric car, you go, uh, Tesla wins. Like there's not nothing even well, close in, in that category. Competition is is good. Like any time one right. company corners the market on something, innovation stalls. And mm-hmm. I know I think Tesla's doing their best to keep that from happening. But I mean, I, I think having competition from other cars out there is just overall a good thing. Okay, so yeah. for instance, before I bought the Model Three, I was looking very heavily into other cars that you know were had some kind of self driving. So I was maybe you know looking at the Honda Accord has a pretty decent. You know, they have a, a, I forget what it's called already now, Pro Pro Pilot. No, I don't know. But Pro Pilot is like Nissan or something. Mm-hmm. There's only really two or three decent like lane keep assists that are, you know, would be decent for long road trips and stuff. So that was a big factor for me. So I was, of course, looking for the, the companies I'm familiar with. I've owned Hondas before. You know, my family's owned, you know, Nissan in the past. Like those are cars that I, I'm familiar with. And the fact that they had these options made me then really look into self-driving yeah. features really look into you know when i was looking at the leaf i was like oh that's a pretty decent range you know how how much is it going to cost me to have all these options oh now that's the price of a model three yep okay so now a model three you know like i think that's going to be a similar train of thought is it'll finally be like a, someone is a fan of nissan someone is a fan of chevy someone's a fan of audi blah 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 chevy you know whatever insert your company name they're going to come out with an electric car You'll see and think that's cool because like, oh, they did it. I, I'm curious what this looks like. They'll find a review comparing that car versus a Tesla. And it's going to be always in Tesla's favor because they are like, factually. This isn't we're going to get called Tesla fanboys here, but it's just physically like they're way ahead. Way yeah, ahead. The, the specs on the e-tron is like the specs on my 2013 Model S. Mm-hmm. Literally. Well, going back to the marketing, I mean that that's that's where I came from. That's that was my where I spent the last fifteen years of my life, and and I I just I I was just blown away by the anti-selling in this yeah. ad. Um, and to be fair, I, I mean again, I I understand how these these thought processes work, and they were kind of doing like they said, there's no place to charge it, and they showed us a, 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 a shot of somebody charging it at a, at a public charging station. Uh, there's not enough range, and they showed a shot of it driving through a countryside or whatever. Um, so, I mean, they were trying to do counterpoints to it, but it still was just on the surface, 30 seconds of a guy giving all these reasons why you shouldn't buy this car. (laughs) And, and, and then, and I didn't even know about the one that you just showed that it's called not for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's the reverse psychology, right? Like, uh, we have a, a, a brewery out here in San Diego called Stone Brewery and, uh, their one of their front, one of the first famous beers was called Arrogant Bastard Ale, oh, yeah. and and when you read the, I think the the thing underneath it says you're not worthy, yeah. and then if you read the label, it's like your palate is not sophisticated enough to truly enjoy this beer. Why don't you go back to drinking a Bud Light or something like that, or uh, Yellow Fizzy Beer? Yeah. So, you know, mm-hmm. I get that style. And, and I do of too. Marketing. I get I get that as a marketing um, tactic, but but you're like, yeah, yeah, it's a little too early for that, or like. Yeah. Those... When you're introducing something, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and those specs uh, that th- like 
unfortunately, like if you did that same ad for a Tesla, it would be laughable. But for an Audi, it's actually like there's a bit more truth in that than yeah. probably is worth saying. Like where oh, there's not enough charge? range. Like, what is it, 180 miles? Actually, yeah, there's really not enough range. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like, if it were like, oh, 370 miles, like, oh, that's fine, right? Yeah, yeah. I would go more than yeah, that. Yeah, there's like too much truth in that for it to, to be a good ad. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just had that to rant a little bit about it. Because I, I saw it, and it was kind of like, did I really just watch that? Did <laughs> that funny. really just happen? That's that's really funny. I did not. Yeah. Well, that makes me think of why don't they just change how ads are? Oh, wait. <laughs> what? Why don't they just? Why don't they just? You guys See, ready for this week's? I, why don't I they told just? you guys it was all downhill from here. <laughs> I, know, I know. Are you guys ready for this week's? Why don't they just? Because here uh, it is. Go for it. So we had two actually. This is they're going to be kind of lumped into the same category. Zach. Um, at sleeve 180 on Twitter asks, why don't they just use the reaction control systems to spin Starship or any other spacecraft for artificial gravity? We also had almost the same question come from Lars Gregorius at Kira Talks. Why don't they just make spinning sleep quarters on ISS? So, Isn't this uh, O'Neill cylinder? Isn't that part of the deal? Is it not? Is yeah, it a sp- part. spin grav? That is part of like an O'Neill, O'Neill cylinder. Yeah, I yeah, don't I like know. That. My thoughts, I don't know about that specific reason why they don't do that, but I, it sounds like a uh, spinning ship for simulated gravity is a good idea and in the works. Am I wrong? I don't know if there's one in the works. I don't know if there's one in the works either. But the O'Neill, O'Neill cylinder is not a spinning simulator. Well, yeah, gravity? but that's not really in the works. That's like saying like a... You know, a moon. It? Ba- it's 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 in the works as in the same capacity that like a moon settlement is. Yeah. Oh, like I thought Bezos course, was doing it. No, he wants to provide the infrastructure to make it possible. Oh, basically, gotcha. that's, that's the ultimate dream. He always sends these cryptic texts to me, so I'm you know I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> O'Neill cylinders. I want. And then Ben's yeah. like, hmm. I'm like, what is this? Like, is this some some new drug these kids are doing, or something billionaires? And then just says Friday, six o'clock, and you're like, what? What? What's this mean? What about yeah. Shaquille O'Neal? What? <laughs> Joe, what do you think? Why why don't they just do that on the ISS or Starship? Um, I don't have the math in front of me, uh, nor would I be able to calculate it in my head anyway. But um, I think you need a giant. Not even necessarily ship, but it's you know like just just spinning in one place is not enough to really give you the gravity that you need. You have to be like really far apart, almost like there's a fulcrum on the other side. Is that the right word? And it's mm-hmm. and it spins in this giant thing. So like spinning quarters on the I think that would just make you dizzy on the ISS. But um, like if you if you had a ship and there was a huge weight on the other side of it, and they were kind of rotating around each other, you might be able to simulate that. Mm-hmm. Um, or just like another Almost like, like oh, in, in the 2001, right? They, they've got, it's a pretty small, confined space, and they've got that awesome shot where he's running in this, you know, circle. Mm-hmm. Um, even, I think, in spaces that small, it seems like I read somewhere that uh, the gravity at your head would be far less than at your feet. So yeah. it, it's... You actually need a lot more distance to really create something close to what we feel now. So that that's a very rambling answer, I guess. That's you pretty much nailed it right there. That's exactly oh. the reason. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it, please. It, it, in that book Delta V by Daniel Suarez again, they 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 create this, and it's a very like researched you know kind of book that they didn't he didn't just say oh and it works. Uh, and w- one of the weird <laughs> things that they that he talked about in that was how, yeah, h- how the gravity differs at different parts. And so it, it, the way I think they, they and I don't know if there's images of it, but uh, like renderings, but th- there were like different pods that were all circling around each other, like a bike wheel or something. And, and if you wanted to go from one to the other, you would essentially go into microgravity and then come mm-hmm. out of microgravity. So there, there's like a ladder. And if you're not paying attention, I think someone, uh, someone at some point in the book, like they were traveling from one to the other, and they forgot to hold on to the ladder because they're in microgravity, and all of a sudden they just got sucked down and, and died, because they like as they were approaching the other one, gravity kicked in, 
and they mm-hmm. they were they were you know just as it kicked in they sped up as they sped up it kicked in more so they got to the point where they just actually like hit the yeah. the the hole and splat yeah. you know so it was like all kinds of weird challenges it seems like if if you had something physically like this well no you have those those things that you see at the carnivals where the they whirl you around and then they drop the floor and you stick to the wall um, that works if you're flat against that surface but if you mm-hmm. were st- trying to stand up on that i don't think it would work because you like i said the head the gravity at your head would almost be negligible as, as opposed to what's down at your feet so the so the center of your mass is actually not against that wall it's like further up and so you, don't, you were don't you one of those kids that. that could always like spin around and go upside down and do all the like moves on those things i don't know if i've ever actually been on one to be honest what I guys, I had a problem. I think I ruined my sense of balance on one of those things because I wrote it like we have this place, this crappy amusement. It's not that crap. It's just fine. It's an Iowa amusement park called uh, Adventureland. You know, you can imagine there's only like ten rides in the thing because we are, yeah. Uh, and one of them is one of those like silos, and it's so not busy during the summer that you can just go on it continually. So of course I want to uh, like six times in a row. And it, all of a sudden, like, something just clicked on, like, the sixth time where I'm like, I don't feel good. And, like, I honestly think it, I, I like, ruined something in an in inner ear or something. That I was probably, like, 15 when I did that. Oh, so man. I don't like that stuff anymore. <laughs> yep. I've never been a fan. So, okay, so back to the answer to this question. Joe, you pretty much have it exactly on. There, there's a certain diameter. So you can make up for a diameter by spinning it faster, right? Mm-hmm. So you can have a small cylinder spinning at, say, five rpm or whatever you know five rotations per minute and you could develop 1g or whatever you need like you don't need 1g we're 1g's maybe excessive down here even if you had half a g that might be enough to you know sleep better exactly like that might be there's probably some magic number that we'll find someday but basically the further out you go oh that's cool so ben's sharing with us a picture of like an artificial gravity this is a rendering from what they did for the book cool oh okay Okay, so that's interesting because normally they make a ring at the end, so you have like a lot of habitable space. But regardless, so you can gain like you don't have to rotate nearly as quickly if you have a really wide diameter. And there is a threshold where you know if you're just stand and walk around, you obviously like Joe said, like your inner ear has a problem. Your if your feet have a different amount of gravity or at a different speed, it'll feel like you're continually falling or something like that too. Um, so. Yes, there's there's a threshold there where you have to have the right amount of distance, the right diameter, the right RPM. And so for something like the ISS, they would have to attach a huge module, like 30 meter in diameter, and it had to spin at 2 RPM or something in order to, you know, have gravity that you yeah. could, that's usable and, and, and valuable is the other part. Because yes, like gravity on the ISS is fine, but people are only up there for six months. They come back, they're fine. It's not a big deal. Yeah. For deep space missions to Mars, you're still only about six months in transit, and you'll well, be fine when you land. What's on Mars? Mars gravity one third or something? Thirty eight percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's so, enough to where you. Well, we probably don't know for real, but that's I, we think enough to like. If you're there for a year, you're not gonna. Die. Yeah. You, hopefully, you'll be able to like fight off bone loss a little bit there, yeah. and not totally I, lose all your muscles in two years or whatever. Spring a lot of I th- milk. I think you will still <laughs> have a major like I feel I really feel bad for the first person to go to Mars and come back to Earth. They are mm-hmm. going to be miserable <laughs> when they like, get no, back. No, I'm to going Earth. back. I'm going back. Yeah. yeah. And so then so for the ISS it's a matter of like it's really probably not worth it. You know, it, it's adds a lot of complication. Especially you can't spin the whole station because your solar panels need to yeah. stay you know, facing the sun, your heat radiators need to be facing away from the sun. So you can't just spin the whole station. You have to, you'd have to have like a module and there was supposed to be, um, an artificial gravity module that, that Japan developed for science experiments, you know, a smaller, there is a, there is something up there that's already that, but there's actually a pretty decent centrifuge that, um, that Japan JAXA has sitting in a parking lot. It's done. <laughs> it just never flew. This hasn't gone up. I was, yep. no, I was curious if they've done any just, tests on like having two modules connected by a tether even and, and just seeing what kind of artificial gravity they can create that's I mean, definitely we, have they ever that you're aware of has they ever actually tested that in any way 
the only thing I can think of where something started spinning while connected to another spacecraft where it's kind of anchored like that was Gemini. Gemini like, 8, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was it with, 8 or 9? Something yeah. around there with, yeah. with Neil Armstrong where he docked to the Agena target vehicle. And as soon as he did, a thruster got stuck on and all of a sudden they started spinning out of control basically. Um, end over end, and I'm, that produced quite a bit of gravity. I think they got to like something almost to passing out gravity, yeah, which is nuts. Um, so yeah, the, the question with the same with Starship has the same answer. It's too small a diameter to spin like you know on the yeah. Z axis, you know, like a corn cob again. <laughs> I'll keep saying that for people listening. Um, <laughs> so that's too small of a, a diameter. Although you know, Skylab was. A pretty cool thing where they could run a ring around Skylab, and I think that's what seven meters or something. That looked really cool. Skylab was so cool. Skylab was so it, it, cool. It was it was the most voluminous space I think that we've ever put up there for yes. people to live in. And only three people like went yeah. in at a time too. Ben, so for, for you, Scott, so <laughs> <laughs> so I can Saturn, Google. I know how Saturn to do this. Saturn V rocket. Uh, we just talked about Sty- Skylink. Starlink or whatever. <laughs> so Skylink? the Saturn V. Is it called Sky? Oh god. <laughs> so the Saturn V. One day they just instead of having an upper stage and then the Apollo capsule and all that stuff on top of it, they just made the third stage a like a habitat. So the it was really cool because it was basically just using it was it was so cool. It was huge and like it was cheaper than the ISS. Like we could have put two up there really cheap. Mm-hmm. Had this major like I really want to see something like this happen again. Um, anyway, maybe Bigelow will get there. Maybe. Yeah. No. And maybe this, you know, new commercial stuff will be able to get stuff up there cheap enough. Skylab is super cool. It's literally just the upper stage of a, of a, uh, a Saturn V. Yeah. So the question is though, will it be necessary to provide artificial gravity on long-term long duration trips, say to Mars? So even if you tether, say two starships together, which could be very doable, and you might need to have two starships landing at the same time for redundancy purposes or something like that, um, you know, put a, a tether on them and, and spin them that way. But you still have that same problem of like radiation uh, or radiating heat away. I mean, um, and your solar panels. Like, how do you get your solar panels to stay affixed? Well, I imagine too, it would have to be a, a rigid tether. It couldn't just be like a rope. Because it could be. Well, but what if one of them goes a little bit faster than the other one? And, Gra- and it'll balance it, out. You, it will. Yeah, because yeah. it, it just seems like if, if that weren't perf- spun perfectly, then it could create all kinds of problems and they could like hit each other or something like that, right? I see what you mean. Uh, I think that'd be actually very difficult to, to do because they're, yeah, like physics will basically make it so they would want to rotate together. But yeah, that... That is probably something that they have to consider, I guess, because I see what you mean. Where like if one rolled a little bit in or something, could like like yeah. like if they're tied together and then this one went way faster than the other one, it may create like a slack in the line, and but they're still connect. I don't know. Like yeah, it seems like hmm. I don't know. Just from a very like I don't know Jack about this thing, <laughs> <laughs> like maybe a more rigid structure where if one moves, it also in- pushes the other one. Right. At the same time, might be. Well, here's know. an. I'm making this up. Here's a, an idea. Maybe a third. Say, say you have two starships tethered. Maybe there's a, a vehicle that goes up on a cargo version of the starship that is like just a giant solar panel that you know unfolds, has heat radiators on the back, and then two tethers that come off of it, and it's the anchor point, so that can stay facing the mm-hmm. sun. And it spins these two starships. Like mm. maybe they develop cool. something like that, you know, or something that still can solve those problems. Because if starship is as cheap as it is hoping to be, um, you know, throwing up something like that into space as a space tether to be able to provide artificial gravity might very well be worth it. But we'll see. It'd be interesting to see how you would, because it would, like, if you had that thing. Let's say you have two starships and it's spinning and all that with a tether. Traveling through space might. be be more like the math or it might get a bit weird because right if you're just if you're just like a a a square like like a cube sitting up there you can kind of travel in any direction as long as you have a thruster or something that you know puts you that way but if you're if you're if you have to keep spinning one of one of these ways you kind of lost an axis right and you'd have to like travel like this because if you wanted to go this way then it would jack up your rotation well what they would do what they would do uh you're right because actually that's spin stabilization is is very much a way to to make it so you only have control in one direction because yeah it'll null out your other Mm -hmm. your basically your two so you really can only go in in the direction you're pointing um 
but what they would have to do is de-spin. So like you'd have to have adjustment, you know, course corrections initially, like mm-hmm. once you get in space and all this stuff, you'd get on course and then you'd be like, okay, we're on a good heading. Now we can do our artificial now gravity. We, spin, yeah. we might three months in have to turn off artificial gravity for a bit to do a course correction, you know, and, and do that, those maneuvers together and then get back into our spin or something. Yeah. I don't know. Interesting. There's a lot smarter people out there that'll have to figure that one out. <laughs> well, we're running a little long and there's still a whole bunch of Tesla stuff to talk about. So <laughs> you want to jump yeah. into that? Let's hear it, Ben. Speaking of things sitting in parking lots in Asia. <laughs> well done. How's that? How's that? Nice. The Model 3 uh, is now available to order in China. So and all China listeners go get one. Yeah. Um, and it may already, uh, I don't know as we're recording this, if it's available or by the time people are listening, it's available. Uh, but yeah, so apparently, um, pre-orders for the new model three made in China. So the deal here is it's, uh, it is a model three, but it also is made at Gigafactory three, uh, in, um, Shanghai there. So that, uh, factory is almost complete, uh, apparently, <laughs> or at least the structure <laughs> is, is complete. It's up. Um, there's some really cool, uh, drone footage and stuff out there. Uh, I imagine there will be huge demand, like just absolutely massive demand for this in China, because in 2018, China, um, Chinese people bought over 1 million EVs. Um, those are electric vehicles. And that is up 78% from 2017. So in 2018, they bought over a million vehicles in China, the largest market by far in in the world. And that, that was up 78% in uh, 20 from 2017. So 2019, I mean, and, and Tesla with the brand, uh, and obviously the tech and all that, because there's a lot of EV companies that are only in China, like BYD is a good example. So, uh, this I imagine is going to sell incredibly well. Plus there is a supercharger infrastructure already there as well so it's it's kind of like set up to be just really massive now um, china was only slightly edged out in the growth rate uh from 2017 to 2018 by the u.s which had a 79 percent so just one percent more growth year over year for evs in the united states which Mm -hmm. was almost entirely due to the model 3 uh, in 2018. So hmm. uh, it actually accounted for 138,000 out of 158,000 uh, increase in EV sales in the U.S. So but they have three times the population we have. Right. So that and, percentage increase is quite a bit more and in a, actual numbers. Correct. Uh, and uh, the government actually um, uh, is doing things <laughs> in this direction where they are encouraging people to buy uh, uh, elect- electric vehicles and uh, also, you know, renewable energy and things like that. Like China's really, really pushing hard for this. Um, so, yeah, they're having an event. Um, like I said, it might be right now. It might be when you're listening to this. It might be right before this posts. I don't know. Um, and I'm really curious, hoping that we will see uh, some numbers out of this some uh, some actual like reservation numbers like we got for the u.s because this could be i mean guys this could be hmm. like yeah triple the population we have still these you know an even greater amount of demand and you're a year later so the model 3 is even better than uh than it was when they first originally unveiled it so really exciting stuff uh happening over in uh in china yeah one of the the funny articles that i read recently there's so many to keep track of uh was was making the argument that well car sales have gone down by like 17 percent in china <laughs> and i'm like but ev sales haven't ev sales are going through the roof yeah i think mm-hmm. it accounted for almost eight percent of car sales in china which is uh which is wow. massive considering yeah. how many mm-hmm. how big that market is yeah and china definitely has i mean China is an interesting country though, because you have you have a very large regions of poverty too. Like there's a lot of people that are are well below what we'd consider you know the poverty line here, but there's also like a, a weird percentage of like unbelievable wealth in China too. Mm. There's this huge class disparity, right. um, and they love their expensive cars. I mean, luxury cars have always sold very very well in China, so it'll be really interesting to see a class of this vehicle. Um, that probably is still, this will be interesting. I'm really curious to see what these numbers are going to be like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It'll be big. I mean, hopefully Tesla is open as they have been in the past about this and they, and Elon tweets these numbers out or whatever. Otherwise we'll have to wait till, do they have to disclose this in an earnings report? That's actually an interesting question because I think it's technically a separate company out there. Hmm. 
Mm. Yeah. Mm. So either they'll tell us in a day or two uh, what's going on, or we'll have to wait uh, a couple months here until the next earnings report. They'll they'll at least say something at the earnings report about it mm-hmm. if they don't. Yeah. I don't know if they have to specifically disclose it because, like currently, for example, they don't disclose any um, location based uh, information. So so if they say they had they sold uh, you know a hundred thousand cars last quarter or something, they don't tell you where. Um, hmm. and where those came from at all. So so there's a lot of people out there that research this stuff, and you look at a lot of the local uh, uh, government agencies that show registrations for these vehicles, uh, which in a lot of countries is public. China, not sure <laughs> if, uh, how, how much data the, 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 they'll, uh, the, they will share, but it's uh, going to be really interesting to watch because this could be, I mean, this could be just a, a mass, like on those charts that show deliveries, this could be another, oh, yeah, punk, there you go, like hockey stick again, mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah. And just uh, to clear up some some myths around this, the and tell me if I'm wrong, the the Chinese Gigafactory is being funded by local investors, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. local funding. Because so, that was something else I read in a funny article. They're like, they're spending all this money on the China Gigafactory, and they're going to go bankrupt because of it. And I was like, no, <laughs> no, that doesn't affect money on that. Yeah, and and the weird thing is, I think it was five hundred million dollars, which when I thought about that, I'm like, is that it? <laughs> I guess. I mean, sure, that's a lot of money, but it seems like it would take more <laughs> to build a whole well, gigafactory. Things, things which, are cheaper in China, especially their manufacturing. They have nailed some massive manufacturing projects. Like yeah. they have that stuff down like crazy. Construction. Yes. Right. Right. As I mean, you can see, just from from uh, mm-hmm. all the videos online at this factory. I mean, like a couple months ago, it was just a dirt lot, and yeah. now there's like a building there. <laughs> it's <laughs> You're insane. Like, okay. You know, so I'll, I, I'll, I want to know your opinion. Is there something else, like some kind of surprise that's going to be happening at the Skiga factory, like the semi or like something that we're, you know, or is it just going to be we're going to make some Model 3s there? As far as I know, it's just Model 3s. Um, and it's yeah. just for China, right? They're not, they're not going to be like using that China factory to make cars no. for the... No. For China. The US, I don't believe so. No, no. What the, about the, 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 rest the of China Asia? factory is designed to to make cars for the Chinese market. Yeah. Probably, you know, Japan and other like markets nearby. Mm-hmm. Um, right hand drive cars, maybe. Mm, well, right hand drive right Asian hand, cars. <laughs> I don't right know. Right hand drive cars for Asian markets, maybe. Like yeah. uh, Australia's right hand drive, and, and is mm-hmm. Japan also? I believe. Yep. Yep. Australia and New Zealand get like all their cars straight from Japan or specifically New Zealand when you it's funny all of the like I rode in a couple of my friends cars when I was in New Zealand and even like the the flip down you know sun visors or everything's in Japanese the infotainment yeah. systems are in Japanese because yeah. there's yeah because they yeah, just so import them straight from I, Japan I believe the EU has laws uh, surprise, surprise, that uh, <laughs> regulate how those cars get delivered as well. This could be a tariff kind of thing. But I, so for example, I believe right-hand drive cars, which in the in in the eurozone, whatever, is just the UK, I believe. Right? Are there any other countries that drive on the right side? Um, uh, so, I mean, Ireland. I think it is just the UK. Ireland. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So so anyway, so you know that little constellation of uh, land, and. They, uh, they, I believe, are assembled in Germany or something like that. The, the, there's something where, like, the cars are manufactured, 90% of them or something in Fremont, shipped over there, and then final assembly happens in Europe for some weird law rule kind of a thing. Um, so I don't imagine the Chinese factory would be making right-hand drive cars for Europe, is my point. Okay. Um, because of some other thing. I think that's how it currently um, is done. If somebody knows, let us know in the comments, I'm sure. Well, like I have to ask. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's yeah. not all. That's Ooh. not all. But what there's, there's there? more. But wait. You think what that, you know, I'd buy that for a dollar. So there is some other news. Now, this is a surprise to me, speaking of surprises, that at Fremont in California, they're going to be make Tesla's going to be making the Model Y there. Why? I don't know. Mm. Uh, where? I don't know. Now, when I went to Fremont, and I've been, uh, I don't know, maybe three or four times, I've only been on a couple tours, it, it's packed. And as Elon has said, mm. it's packed to the gills, I think was the quote. Uh, there is no room for any of this. In fact, you know, they built the Performance Model 3 line uh, in a uh, very advanced 
uh, tarp. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it. There was some term that, that the engineering team used. Um, and I believe Elon ha- had some comments about this, that they could maybe make another line out outside in a <laughs> in a tent um, for the Model Y uh, out in the back on the north side. I don't know, so somewhere like that. But then in this article from Tesla Roddy, they said that they were going to combine, combine the Model S and X line so that they could make room for the Y. To my knowledge, that's already happened. They did that for the Model 3 because inside of the plant, there were only two lines. There was one for S and one for X. And last time I was there, they had told me that they combined those lines and then added, you know, the, the or basically shifted the Model 3 to one and the Model S next to another. So I'm confused by Tesla Roddy reporting that. I don't know either they're misinformed or Tesla didn't do what they said they were going to do. Um, but in, in any event, Model Y apparently is going to be made at Fremont. Not sure how I feel about that. I think it would have been a smarter move to do it at Giga. Maybe there's there's probably a thousand reasons why they chose this. Um, but last we had heard officially was that they were undecided. Um, so that's where that's at. Uh, along with this comes out uh, a, a leak or a rumor. I don't know if this is confirmed, but the Model S will be getting a refresh around September time frame, I believe it said. And uh, this will be an interior refresh to uh, kind of align the interiors more, kind of with the Model 3 minimalist design, which I'm... I'm not that excited about personally. Uh, and it will reportedly be getting a battery upgrade that will push it above 400 miles. So Whoa. that's crazy. That is incredible. Um, I am super pumped on that. And wait, what's uh, the I'm time frame for that? I'm not super in love with the interior, though, uh, change. When's the, what's the time frame for that? September. Mm, man, I want a, I want a refresh desk. That would be awesome. Yeah, I'm a little. I'm curious how how that'll come out because going to one screen, like they would have to have a heads up display, and it personally, like like if they didn't have some kind of information behind the steering wheel that's a heads up display or kind of how they have it now, um, that would be a big mistake. And then if the screen, the middle screen, is not similar size to what's out there now. I actually think this will, this will sell any cars that are already made with the current design because I, I, I think the design now is fantastic. And if you took a lot of that away, it would be like, why am I buying this? I'll just buy a Model 3. It's basically the same thing. So I, think, I was actually just thinking that, like, like what, what is going to be the differentiator between the two? I mean, battery size, clearly, size of the car, clearly. But it's, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be a higher luxury car. So have you, right? it seems like ever, it should have something that the 3... Has there ever been a car, though, Ben, you're complaining about there not being, like, a separate screen. When is the last time you sat in a 3 Series BMW and a 5 Series BMW and go, look, the 5 has um, two more knobs here. Like, the interior is the exact same. They're just a different, one's a little bit bigger, rides a little bit nicer, maybe a little bit more, you know, speed. Like, you're not buying it because the screen is, there's two screens now, like... To me, like literally sitting in a three and a five is identical for a BMW, you know, yeah. one's yeah. just a little so bit more luxurious. I, I hear where you're coming from, and I personally don't miss the heads up display or the, 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 front, of the, the Same. front of the steering wheel screen, the second screen. I don't miss it at all. So I wouldn't cry if it went away in the, in the S, but, but I know a lot of people do like it. And I, it is just a little extra something Yeah. that, that maybe it just kind of like feels like I'm getting this I don't know. Yeah. Does, does that make sense? Like it is, it's just something extra that the three doesn't have that you can say, Hey, the S has this. Right. So it's worth 50,000 more dollars. You know, <laughs> I can see them doing something like that, but the one, I really hope that just the update, I'm ready for an update because I hate the cup holders in an S like how mm. they're integrated into the armrest. I hate like, well, you don't really use those ones, by the way, you use the center console ones or I personally. Yeah. But those ones are like kind of clunky and they feel weird. Mm, I like, disagree. I would rather, I would rather. Your sex tape. <laughs> I I just I don't know. So I, he, here's I'm showing on the screen. Um, if you guys are listening, I'll try to describe it. This is what Electric posted back in July of last year, yeah. so almost you know about a year ago. Uh, this was apparently was a leak interior rendering of the Model S uh, refresh, the interior design here, and uh, and it looks like there's maybe this. Uh, this bar that goes across behind there, which would have, you know, could be another display. And then you have the big center display. 
I think that would be okay. I would just be really bummed if I if I lost functionality, right? Because I'll tell you what, like like I get them the Model Three now, and I have a real hard time with how small that screen is because there's just so much information on there, and and it's clearly a you know perspective thing where you're coming from because mm-hmm. on mine, w- having the screen in the back, the things that are really useful. Um, speed and all that is fine. The autopilot stuff is really cool how you can see all the other cars directly. And then the navigation, having it right there is really useful. That is cool. Um, yeah. And, you know, if this screen here, if the center screen didn't have that leftmost panel where, you know, the car is and all that stuff is, I think it would be, like, sufficiently big. But when you have that, plus you have like music infotainment type stuff uh and and you should have the map and navigation going it's just like it's just too small man like it's just not it's trying to pack way too much information you know and i know the user interface designers are like you know busting their butt trying to do their best but it's just not big enough so i think you know if you can offload you know a third of that screen over to somewhere else you know it'd probably be fine but for me you know it's definitely like very noticeable when I get into my wife's car of just like, oh man, I got to really like, like strain to see where things are. And it's, you know, cause I'm not in it every day. It's like, where, what's going on with this little tiny screen? So. <laughs> it's so funny. Cause that's like the number one thing that people that don't, you know, aren't familiar with Tesla is, does that screen come standard? Is that an iPad on there? Like, yeah, you know, it's so it's, massive, yeah. you know? But compared to an S and an X, it's it's small. But I I, yeah. I think from a UI standpoint, they're definitely going to go with a horizontal screen, and maybe really? have yeah because then they don't have to design two UIs, one that's vertical, one that's horizontal, and then uh, maybe they'll have a, a secondary little screen like you're still complaining about for like speed limit think, and all that I stuff. Think but I for think for navigation this, and for some of the autopilot stuff would be really cool. Like um, yeah, I, I like that the drive panel that's on the left side of the Model Three. If that was basically behind the steering wheel and yeah. then the right was just a horizontal screen you could literally that. have like a, a phone size display mm-hmm. just right behind it kind of embedded with with a bar that looked you know very mm-hmm. seamless or whatever i think you could do a great thing yeah if you got rid of it entirely and you also reduce the size of the screen from this massive like vertically oriented one to this to like what the model 3 has i i think personally i would be like oh no that that's a downgrade you know mm-hmm. Yeah. We'll see, won't we? I think it'll be interesting. Um, but the Model Y getting made at Fremont is also a little bit... I mean, it maybe makes sense because, like, hey, we already have all the people here. We can, you know... But where are you going to put it, man? Where are you going to put it? Maybe maybe they could integrate the Model 3 and Model Y lines because they share so much of the same parts, you know? Mm-hmm. I think that that might be possible, but but if that's true, I mean that's clearly like probably low lower barrier to entry and lower capital expenditure to get that going than it is to say build a whole new manufacturing line at at the Gigafactory one. So I'm right. still baffled that the Gigafactory one has not really been finished yet, and they're and yeah. they're wanting to cram more stuff into Fremont, and I'm just kind of like, why don't you finish out the <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's something I don't know about. It's probably a lot more difficult than I'm making it out to be, but it's just like, it seems like you've got space right there that you just haven't finished yet, so finish it. I'm sure, <laughs> yeah. it's, I'm I sure it is. It I know I'm way with, oversimplifying With workers, it, you know? I, yeah, I was going to say, it's probably labor. It's probably labor. It's hard to get 5,000 people to move out to the desert. Yeah. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> And you know, five thousand dislikes we just got there from people. <laughs> that are like, I live in the desert, and I, I live here. It. I want to work there, yeah. right? <laughs> well, if you do, tell Tesla that you'd want to make a car in the desert. I don't know. I, yeah, yeah. Dang. Well, guys, is that is that all the stuff we have to talk uh, about this there week? Was, there was one more thing that. Um, I would normally just skip over it because we are running kind of long, but I did mention it at the beginning, so I feel obliged to... Oh, freedom yeah. gas. Freedom, freedom gas. gas. What is freedom gas? All right, so hang on. I actually it's a never... euphemism for many things. <laughs> for, I know, in my uh, household. For, my, for our viewers, I actually almost never share my screen, so I might totally screw this up. Let me just <laughs> see here. Just going to be his bank account? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> just... Okay, can you all see you my screen? It. Yeah, you did it. All right, yay. yay. So, uh, yeah, there was a report that came out. This is on Ars Technica that the Department of Energy just released um, 
where they referred to using fossil fuels as freedom gas. Oh, oh my God. God. Um, what? They're saying it's an, an, a rebranding of energy dominance. So let me let me actually see if I can find the actual term that they mm. used here. Uh, okay, so the DOE, I'm just going to read a little. DOE Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy, uh, Stephen Winberg, was quoted as saying, With the U.S. in another year of record-setting natural gas production, I am pleased that the Department of Energy is doing what it can to promote an efficient regulatory system that allows for molecules of U.S. freedom to be exported to the world. <laughs> And uh, there was an article in Slate that, uh, oh, actually, no, here, here it is. Uh, also in the press release, uh, Undersecretary of Energy Mark W. Menezes, I guess, uh, refers to natural gas as freedom gas. He says, in- increasing export capability or capacity from the Freeport LNG project is critical to spreading freedom gas throughout the world. That just sounds mm, bad. Yeah. By giving America's allies a diverse and affordable source of clean energy and uh, apparently, this was first referred to by former Dancing with the Stars contestant Rick Perry, who is now the uh, Department of Energy secretary. Uh, he was he was saying the United States is again delivering a form of freedom to the European continent, and it's oh, in the wow. form of liquefied natural gas. Wow. Before before anyone gets to the comment section, guys, uh, <laughs> first off, we're not making fun. I'm I'm not here to make fun of natural gas. I mean, there's benefits and all you know gas in general fossil fuels i think we should start moving away from there's a lot of infrastructure that's really hard to replace with solar wind and sustainable energy for now but can we all agree that coining something freedom gas is just the most like i don't like walmart thing to do (laughs) i don't know another way to put it like what? Why? Oh. Freedom gas is uh, ten cents cheaper at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Here at Walmart, I, uh, we sell you freedom gas. I simply gas. Uh, this is what I thought when I read that. I was like, remember the good old days of about eighteen months ago when we were worried that we were living in a post-truth society. I think we're officially living in a in a in a post-parody, a, a post-satire <laughs> society now. Like, like you yeah. can't actually make up stuff funnier. That, then. That's an Onion article headline about yes. a real thing that happened. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. The Onion is going out of business, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And can I say, too, like, so this, because this isn't meaning to be political, really. I mean, yes, we mentioned there's a person involved here that's a part of a political affiliate. But the thing is, in my opinion, the most freedom thing you can ever get is the freaking sun and the freaking wind that is spewing across your own country and collecting it for yourself you can literally power your your own life Mm -hmm. if you have the right resources you don't need to rely on someone drilling a hole you know a thousand kilometers away or in another country you can provide your own power to me that is freedom like if that's not freedom energy independence yeah Mm and proper how is that not our number one like cheering like rah 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 we can do this ourselves you know it's funny because in California, it's it was such a thing, or it is such a thing, that now you get penalized for some of this stuff. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. so many people that have solar that they're taking away incentives for solar because it hurts the, the, the big uh, infrastructure, you know? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Now, the, the, the only... Okay, so as hilarious as this is, and of course it's Rick Perry... Uh, which <laughs> I don't care. I don't even know which party he's a part of, but he's a funny guy. He is hilarious. Like there's so many cases, but anyways, so it's nice and easy to make fun of Rick Perry. I, I don't mind this because natural gas is really what killed coal and is what really is a di- and now. And this, but like coal itself, uh, I, I don't think is the problem. I, I think it's that there hasn't been something to come into place and help all the people that are being displaced by this. But to blame things like solar that as like the the enemy of the state here that kills the fossil fuel industry is not really true. Like natural gas is the one that is taking over because it's cheaper and mm-hmm. better in so many ways. And even from a renewable or from a climate standpoint, it's like 50 to 60 percent better uh, in terms of overall emissions. So I, I don't I mean... I think it's funny, <laughs> but I, I don't think it's a bad thing to still like raw raw around natural gas. Like it's a step in the right direction, mm-hmm. um, and and really like the the biggest thing for me is is people that would uh, be like like don't 
like don't be you know good versus the is the enemy a perfect kind of a thing like 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 don't be angry about natural gas in light of solar because like yeah sure we'll get there like but let's mm-hmm. try to take away the dirtiest most polluting things and work towards it so mm-hmm. i don't i don't really like i'm not i'm not a super hater on natural gas i just really think that the the parts of the, of this country specifically that have basically been exploited for by energy companies for coal yeah. uh, should step up and do something for those people to help them get you know to to help to help bring them jobs to help bring them things mm-hmm. here i mean i believe uh, was it like solar panel installers like the number one energy job in the country so it's one mm-hmm. of those things like mm-hmm. like i think that things are moving in the right direction this seems kind of like a funny aside honestly yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> whatever happened to the bloom box do you remember that the bloom, bloom box never heard of it Maybe I should do a video on this. No, this was it's a while back, like ten years ago or so. This guy, his last name was Bloom. I seem to remember. That's why it was called the Bloom Box. But it was, it sounds like a boom box. Uh, <laughs> but no, it, it was it was a it was basically a, a power source for your home that was run on natural gas. So you would like basically connect this box to your gas line, and inside of it, it would do whatever it is it does, and it would power your home with it. And it was hmm. a fairly clean source of of energy for your home. It was like a, a distributed kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I want to say it wasn't about burning the gas and creating energy that way. I want to say it was some kind of chemical process in there where it broke it down. And clearly I, I did not do all my research before I brought that <laughs> up just now. I hadn't thought about it in years, but when you were talking about natural gas, I, was, I remember that. Like A lot of people were saying it was going to be like a, a game changer, and then it just kind of fizzled. Hmm. Yeah. I see. Yeah, I think you're right. And this is one of those I, I'm excited. One of the future videos is might turn into a Raptor video where it's like it's going to take me months. So you might hear me talking about this for a while. But that's a topic that I'm working on starting to research is the um, the pollution of rockets. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of the aspects. And this is a really touchy thing to, to focus on because people are going to be like, yeah, you're just wanting to talk about climate change. It has nothing to do. I just want to look at like, how is a rocket compared to the rest of the transportation industry? Mm-hmm. You know, and when people mm-hmm. say like, they got to stop, you know, using fossil fuels for their rockets. It's like, isn't, like Ben was saying, like, isn't there way bigger fish to fry? Like the <laughs> shipping industry, thing, yeah. airplanes, cars, like rockets pollute probably less than 0.1% like yeah. of our air pollution and ocean pollution. And yes, they're probably the number one contributor to space debris. Now that's a different thing. But <laughs> but as far as, you know, um, like air quality and, and, and that environmental aspect, um, I'll have to look into it and see what the numbers are. But. Yeah, like maybe don't hate on natural gas per se compared to right. It's yeah. it's uh you know yeah like if people hate on natural gas, it's like well at least it's better than this other thing, and you know it's almost like like uh you like you can't you can't say it has something has to be perfect in order for you to do it, otherwise you'll never do it. Right. Right. So so I don't. I mean I think it's a step in the right direction. I think that has really been the thing that's hurt the coal industry, which is not the narrative that. Uh, different politicians out there have been been pushing. So it's one of those things that when you look at the data, you're like, oh, this is really it. I think Vox mm. did a piece on it, and, and it was really eye-opening of like, oh, okay. So this is really where fossil fuel energy comes from. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, and those things are being displaced. I think uh, the Real Engineering Channel or something just did a video on renewable energy and yeah, batteries. Yeah. And yeah, it's one of those things where, where we don't truly have, like you can say pie in the sky, yes, let's just make batteries. But the amount of batteries you actually need to to replace these things 100% is staggering and not something we could, you know, just even if we all put all of our energy into it, we couldn't actually get it done very quickly. So, yeah. you know, it'll be here for a while, uh, but, you know, it's a step, it, it's a better thing than some of the other options, at least, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Freedom! <laughs> Freedom gas. So I told you guys what video I'm kind of working on. That's going to be one of the next things that I'm working on is like the overall, like how much do rockets pollute or what's the environmental impact of rockets? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I might throw in another video or two in there, the kind of short term and I'm going down to Boca Chica to hopefully catch star hopper hopping Boca soon. Chica. So get Woo-woo. ready for that guys. But what are you guys working on? Joe? Uh, my video for Monday is, uh, what's well, going to be titled. What, what is time? So it's a very <laughs> more philosophical look at like what, time is how we've measured it through the years different theories of how it works what what is this passage of time that we experience and 
A little what's bit about the, time travel, but not much. What, what, what's the saying? Uh, what do we want? Time travel? When do we want it? It's irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to use that in your video. Well, I've already <laughs> shot it, so. Oh, oh, you schmuck. Ooh. Dang it. I've got two. I've got, man, I have like 12 videos lined up. It's interesting, isn't it? When Damn. you have a list that you can't catch up on. I, I actually <laughs> have like. fun. <laughs> I have like 30 videos, but I have I have different categories. I have ideas, I have want to do, and I have doing. You're mm. right. I, I'm like my, my list. So and the doing, I have like 12. I, have I can't two, even. Yeah, I have two already shot. One is about selling the Model S. Uh, details on that, kind of the the because I actually did get some work done. Unlike you know people that are just like ah oh, take it, I don't care, get it out of here. I actually had a bunch of work done on it, like brought it back to life. It's like the Model S is looking really good. Going to be sad to get rid of that. And then the other one is um, is autopilot safe? Mm -hmm. Looking at the data they provide, oh, yeah. looking at a really crazy different example of how some technology. Uh, or just kind of how technology gets adopted and some of the other the things that have happened in the past and comparing th this, what's happening with Autopilot, to some of the other advancements in car tech. And, Joe, I've sent you like a dozen yeah. articles on that. I won't, I won't <laughs> spill the beans. Yeah. So that's it. That's it. So those are two of the two that I already shot. Then I'm like, I've got, yeah, so many more. <laughs> but that's fun awesome. stuff. Yeah. Good stuff, guys. Well, so anybody listening, uh, just so you know, I will not be here the next couple of weeks. My my wife and yeah. I are going to be traveling. I'm not going to say where, Yay. but I will Yay. be not here. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if you guys want to replace me with somebody else or just talk amongst yourselves. It's it's up to you. But uh, can we can we have your dog just sit in for you? Yeah, Aww. <laughs> she'd be more entertaining than me. <laughs> well, obviously. I'd never come back. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we need like a button to give her a treat. And <laughs> yeah, well they have those webcams that would work. That, like, that would keep her there. That shoot yeah. treats. Yeah. The dog. I was wondering if you could do that for kids. It's like, <laughs> all right, so <laughs> you want mac and cheese here? Like, clean up that mess over there. And just you just hit a button. Flings mac and cheese all over your house, sticking <laughs> yeah, to the walls just, and stuff. That would be no. so great. I was no. wondering if, like, researchers who, like, work with mice just have, like, big, huge, you know, bottles for their kids to go drink out of in the wall. <laughs> and and they, they train so, them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Oh, uh, well, guys, we'll see you in uh, our ludicrous, ludicrous, ludicrous future. 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 Future.